For this Fish Eater Friday, I've been asked a rather interesting question about the Society of St. Pius X. Is there direct satanic influence connection with the Society of St. Pius X? There are stories about, you know, like the satanic ritual that supposedly went on, I think, with the opening of Vatican II. I think it's in the Broken Cross. <clears throat> I have said in a separate video, I believe that the Society of St. Pius X was set up by the enemy. When I say the enemy, I'm talking about the devil, but also those conspirators who took over Vatican II. Took over and ran Vatican II. They realized there would be a reaction. Some of us would not buy Vatican II and its perfidious spirit. So, they said, Marcel. Okay. That's a separate story. We're talking direct satanic influence. I'm going to tell a few stories. And just tell you the stories as they are. We're going to go to Econ in 1977. Uh, I was in the front row on the epistle side. You know, there was someone to the right of me, I believe. Yeah. And then me. Then the next row back, uh, there was uh, the second youngest student, because I was the youngest. And next to him was an American I knew. I will not use any names in this video. These stories were related to me, and I'll tell them as they related. Well, he was kind of a joker, and he saw my chair sitting there. And he thought, you know, it'd be kind of funny to move the chair out of the way so that when I sat down for the chanting of the Psalms, I went straight on the floor. And the devil approached him in his mind and told him, I will move the chair for you. And offered this to him. He turned down the offer. He told his spiritual director about it, who said that, well, if you had said yes, eventually the devil would have come back, offered more power, and then he'd wanted some. And then eventually he told me the story. So, I mean, the devil is at work. But, I mean, you could explain this one either way. <clears throat> the devil is going to try and go after those who are seeking the truth. Now we get to St. Mary's, and I have several incidents in St. Mary's. Uh, the first one I will relate is in the uh, spring of 1980. I'd gotten down with a stomach flu, so I'd gone back home for a few days. There were two people who worked together running the kitchen at the time, and they had a practice at least one evening a week, after work, and they would work to like 10, 11 o'clock sometimes, they would go down to the main chapel, the Assumption Chapel, and make a holy hour. Well, they're walking down. It's 10, 11 at night. I think it's approaching 11. I think maybe they wanted to make the 11 to 12 that St. Margaret Mary had made Thursday into Friday. In any case, they look, as you're approaching Assumption Chapel, the chapel door is on the left that you come in. On the right is the sacristy. Now the main Assumption Chapel has got a tall ceiling. With well, the sacristy, because I was sacristan, had the main sacristy, and then you went up a set of stairs and you had what I called the work sacristy, where I cleaned candles and did that type of stuff and stored extra things we didn't need. Well, they see flickering light in the work sacristy. Well, by the time they come in the main door, go clear across the back, walk into the sacristy. Now you're walking across marble floors, so you're not going to be quiet. And head up the stairs, the candles all are extinguished, and they're in a circle. When I got back, they immediately told me about it, and I checked out the work sacristy, and whatever was there had been cleaned up. What it was, we do not know. They suspected Satanism. Now, I am an eyewitness to the next story. I'm working in the sacristy in early August before the uh, 
80 pilgrimage. This was going to be the second pilgrimage, which was near the event that 79 had been. And <clears throat> finally, the 45 degrees of hot, and I mean hot with a capital H weather, was broken. A thunderstorm blew up. <clears throat> yeah, not much of a thunderstorm by Oklahoma standards, because that's what I grew up with. In any case, I didn't think anything of it. I just kept working. <laughs> then the rector comes in, comes through the sacristy, gets the uh, tabernacle key, and heads up to the main altar and exposes the Blessed Sacrament. Well, he's from back in the northeast, and then he thinks we need to be praying because a big storm's come up. If we stopped praying pray for every storm like this, we wouldn't need work done. <laughs> Not that we don't pray. <laughs> So he exposes the blast of cycle. Well, all right, quick, get out all the candles and stuff and light all the candles. He didn't do anything then. And he also takes off of the blessed cycle. Well, I figured there was a woman on campus, and uh, this was a great... The Assumption Chapel is the second building in a four-building complex. On the south end, I forget the name of the building. Administration building, I think is what it was originally. It's probably got a different name now because they use another one for administration. They were even using it at that time. In any case, there was an apartment on one on the uh, southeast corner and another one on the southwest corner. Well, on the southeast corner, the woman there had been down sick and I knew she hadn't been making, hadn't made mass in several days. So I thought, well, he's taking her Holy Communion. Thought it's kind of strange to take Holy Communion during a storm. But I thought, okay, he's taking her Holy Communion. Well, I'm watching before the Blessed Sacrament. I had to quit my work because the Blessed Sacrament's now exposed. And then the storm gets over with in a little while. Next thing you know, I see the rector come back, brings the Blessed Sacrament back to the uh, tabernacle, leaves the Blessed Sacrament exposed, so we have to have someone watch until we have a benediction later that day and he is soaked to the skin now this same man had a discussion with um, someone else who related it to me and he said that whenever a st storm blew up he would take the blessed sacrament and sit in the burned out chapel hoping that the uh, walls wouldn't fall in because originally, when the chapel burned in seventy, the fall of 78, it burned all the wood out, the roof, floor, well, most of the floor. But, I mean, the altars were still intact, and they had built uh, a frame around to protect the three altars, and all of the stone walls were still up. Eventually, a storm blew the uh, front wall down, and there's a picture it was been out all over it, in fact even some of the local news used that as well as their pictures it was a slide of that picture now of course they bulldozed the whole chapel that's another story and I thought well, that's kind of strange when I heard the story this was months after the actual incident but I said well I know I know what the story he's telling appears to be true because that would explain everything I had seen now We'll get to a story which actually the event happened before these other two stories. I did not find that the whole story until after I left the society. In the very early spring, probably during Lent of um, 1980, there was a man who was working security. In fact, he had been uh, security on the property from the moment I think they had taken legal possession and closed on the... Uh, contract back in 70, let's see, they closed on contract in 78, summer of 78. In any case, this man worked security. He would patrol the whole complex all night just to keep things under control. Well, <clears throat> there are a bunch of us, we would get up in the morning, go to 7 a.m. mass, it was around 7 a.m. to come back for breakfast. Because he would usually join us for 7 a.m. Mass. Well, he wasn't at 7 a.m. Mass. No one really thought about that. 
We come back. He's got his old station wagon loaded with all of his stuff. Bye, I'm leaving. I'm like, what? Why are you leaving? <laughs> we were asking. He says his goodbyes. He got in that station wagon. He heads back to where he had come from. As I said, I'm not going to give any indication who these people are too much. You might be able to figure some of them out. Someone later got a hold of him and found out why he left. He was on his patrol around uh, 1 or 2 in the morning and he sees light underneath the main altar of the uh, burnout chapel. You see, there was a basement under that part of the chapel and I, I think you could still get there. I know, I never went there. But I think, well, you must have been able to get there because there was light down there. He comes in and goes down to check this light out. Candles are burning. The rector of the St. Mary's is there wearing some funny clothing and in the middle of what he described as a satanic service. Well, he pulled out, went packed, thought he'd stay around and say goodbye, I'm out of here. Now, in research in the early 80s, we found out that Satanists love burnout chapels and to have their rituals in burnout churches, which is exactly what we had there at St. Mary's. And then I'm going to close with another incident I just thought of as I was making this list uh, earlier today. In the St. Mary's area, there were cattle mutilations. It was one of those things that happened late 70s, early 80s in various parts of the country. Um, as with most cases, they never found out who did it or anything, but they just find these mutilated cattle. I mean, they suspect Satanism. No, no proof of it. But there were cattle mutilations in the early 80s. When this priest was transferred out of St. Mary's, the cattle mutilations stopped. Now, whether this is all connected or not, I don't know. But these are stories, and they were told to me all for true. You can take them for what they are. I personally think that Satan is controlling the society in order to deceive the elect. Whether these incidents prove this or not, I, I won't say. I'm just going to put the stories out there and leave them for what they are. I'm not sure after all these stories we're going to want fish this Friday. We may want to fast. <laughs>